And we're live. Tony Hinchcliffe. Hello. Jake the fucking snake. I can't yeah. believe it, man. In hey, the I, flesh, I gotta do sir. this. What do you know, Joe? <laughs> you never heard that before, have you? I've heard it a couple times. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, I've heard, hey, Joe. I heard you shot your old lady down. Yeah, that a yeah few there times you go. As well. There you go. I gotta tell you, man, I watched your documentary last night, and it's yeah. fantastic. I appreciate it. It is. If that thing doesn't bring tears to your eye, you need to go to a doctor. Yeah, you're not human, man. No yeah. doubt. That is. Dallas is a fucking saint. He really is. Hard headed. You know, uh, without it, I'd never made it. Yeah. Because, you, um, you know, us junkies, and we like to lie a lot, you know, and alcoholics do too. But it was a tough, tough road, man. And he guided me through it. He's, you know, a, he never he's gave amazing. Up, never gave up. And uh, I can never thank him enough for what he's done for me and uh, giving me my life back. And not only my life, but my family. I got my kids back. They're, they're all digging me now. I'm a great grandfather, probably the best grandfather ever. <laughs> you know, I'm just saying because it's true. But, uh, I mean, I'll fix anybody up, man. I mean, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the detailing of your recovery, though, and h him taking you in to the what does he call his house? That house, the, the uh, accountability uh, the house, account accountability crib. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. he's a special guy. He it really is, man. is. I mean, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta understand. I mean, no man in his right mind would bring one, much less two, drunks into their home. You know, you got to expect tragedy. You know, there's going to be something come bad out of this. And uh, he was able to hold us together, man. I mean, there were a couple of brief, brief moments that uh, got kind of escalated and got kind of stupid. But uh, he wouldn't give up, man. Well, I got to know Dallas when he came on the podcast. And one, one thing that you get about him is this guy, he he's not just about himself. Like, he is really about helping people out. He gets a buzz yeah. off helping people. Yeah. And which, is to me, is just so amazing. And... I've picked that up off of him. I search people out now in the crowd that have, are having a hard time walking or you see something going on or they're overweight. And you go, hey, man, you know, I'm so-and-so. And it gets me in yeah. using the name Jake the Snake. I can talk to him. Hey, you ever thought about um, trying some DDP yoga, man, because it works. Yeah. And then the, if you've never done it, DDP yoga is, without a doubt, the number one thing out there for getting healthy, man. It, um, it makes your body healthy. It makes your mind healthy. You know, and uh, for him to be out there, he's just a soldier. Yeah, he really I mean, is. He pushes all day long, man. And uh, here's a guy that, that that could be handling it a totally different way, but he still picks up a phone and calls somebody and thanks him for buying the program. Yeah. Who the hell does that? Right, Nobody who does, does do that? that? Yeah, you know, he does it because he wants to know. And the next thing you know, he's been on a 25-minute phone call. And they're sending him photos of the before picture, and then he wants them to look at him in the after picture. You know, six months from now, the stories—he's got a million of them. We played success stories. We played a video when he was in of a gentleman who was the paratrooper. The, yeah, guy could barely walk. Yeah. I mean, he had done a bunch of paratroop missions. Yeah. You know, parachuting out of planes and landing on his knees. His knees are destroyed. Legs are destroyed. Backs Back. destroyed. Yeah. Everything's fucked up. But he starts out, barely can stand, barely can walk. Two canes. Was, yeah, two canes. Mm. By the end of the video, this guy's running. Yeah, man. He's running. Yeah. He's doing full yoga poses. Yeah. And he's it's an these animal. In, incremental steps, incremental steps. But he kept getting better, kept getting better, kept getting better. And that is, it's so symbolic of like your journey in life. If you just decide to give up and decide to just... Fuck the world. I'm just going to just eat and drink myself into been oblivion. There. You have been there. Yeah. You can talk about that. Yeah, I stayed there a long time, man. But then you turn it around. But that's, that's I fucking love that. that I love that, stories like yeah, that. Yeah, but it's a one in a million shot, man, unless you have a Diamond Dallas page in your corner. Right. Because it wasn't only about Dallas helping me. It was the whole crew. Right. See, Dallas, you know, he, he came up with the idea, him and uh, Steve, you, as a business manager, whatever, and... Uh, they said, look, you know, we're going to bring you back through this. We want to film the whole thing. I'm like, I don't know about that because I got burnt bad in a film here a while back, you know. And uh, they just cut me a new one, man. They lied to me. and did yeah. it. Anyway, it happens. We're going to film this whole thing. And at the end of it, if uh, we put it together and you don't like it, it'll never go out. Really? You're going to give me that right? You're going to invest this money and this time because we, I stayed there for three and a half years. Because it took me that long to get clean. That's amazing. You know, I couldn't go in for six months. I've done that. I couldn't go in for four months. I've done that. 
Hell, the time I went in for four months, man, I go across the stage and get my diploma, so to speak, from finishing this course, being in rehab for four months. I go out the other side and pick up a payphone and call my dealer. He meets me outside the damn door, <laughs> man, with a big rock, you know, and a stem. Thank you. Damn. I made it. But that's the insanity of the disease. Mm -hmm. yeah. The disease will let you sit in a place for three or four months and not touch you. Won't even come knocking on your door because it knows right now you're locked into, you're going to do this. But it's over there doing push-ups in the corner, man, waiting <laughs> on your ass. <laughs> as soon as you get away from these idiots over here, they're teaching you bad habits, Jake. Uh, I'm going to get you where you need to be. Yeah. And that was the thing of being there for that long period of time. What was the feeling like when you did slip up? Because you, oh, you slipped up a couple of times. Yeah, four or five times I did, yeah. yeah. What? It was horrible. I wanted to die. Because not only did I feel like I let myself down, but I let him down. And that really sucked. Because here's a guy that's opened up his wallet and said, you come live with me, don't worry about your damn bills, I'll take care of them. Excuse me? Oh, I'm damn sure in now. <laughs> you, know, you don't have to talk twice to me about this crap. Like, yeah, I'm moving in with you, but if you're going to pay all my bills, man, will I get healthy? But I never thought it was going to take three years. Wow. But see, he would take, you know, like, if he had to go do a con or go do some music, you know, go to, do, go do a movie or something, he had people that worked for DDP Yoga, specifically Garrett and a, a young kid named uh, Dylan, who I... I really got the kid messed up, you know, because he had to share a room with me. <laughs> I don't wear clothes, okay? <laughs> and I guess it looked kind of freaky. You know, here's, here's this old wrestler that I've idolized for years, and I'm seeing his junk, yeah. all gray hair and everything, and his long. junk is horrible. You're seeing the snake and, <laughs> and the bag. I accidentally <laughs> bent over picking something up right there by his bed. I had no idea my asshole oh. was in his mouth. Oh. But, uh, yeah, <laughs> Dylan, he lived through some horrible things, and Garrett did too, but... Dallas always made sure I was taken care of. You know, he, whatever he had to do, the first thing he had to do was take care of Jake. And he put me first. I didn't expect that. Who well, would? the solidarity and the, the, the camaraderie that you guys all have, you, and Razor Ramon as well, yeah. when you guys are all in that house together, like the experiences that you guys shared, working together and then still in life, you know, you guys have a bond that's mm -hmm. very, very... It's it's very hard for most people. Yeah, they can't get it. Yeah, man. you know it's like it's like guys that are you know in, in the service together, man. There's just something that becomes they become brothers in one, man. And the, you know, and uh, with Dallas, you know, the thing about him was he's never went down that addiction that addiction road. You know, he, you know, he used to run nightclubs, but he never became an alcoholic. He's a freak. Okay, <laughs> piss on him. Screw him. He got a better car than I did. Okay, I get that. But I like my cars now, man. My cards now are awesome. My life is so good to to go from hell. That's where I was at, man. You have no idea what it's like to wake up and be angry that you woke up because you didn't want to. You wanted, you wanted to be over. And there's been so many years that were like that for me that I wouldn't go out shopping unless it was 3 a.m. because I didn't want anybody to see me because I'd gotten to the point that I hated myself so much that I'm begging God to die. Uh, when I would hear another wrestler had died, I'd get angry at God and curse him for not taking me instead. When Piper died, we were just talking about Roddy before the show started. Man, I was so pissed off that he got to go before I did. You know? And that's just wrong, man. I mean, even when I tried to OD a couple of times, you know, really tried. I took 100 Valium. Jesus Christ. Know, 110 milligram Valium. Woke up. And all I've done is puke on myself. And I said, what a fucking loser you are. You can't even die right. You're a piece of shit. What kind of mind says that? It's a mind that's given up, man. Yeah. The torture that people put themselves through being an addict. People get to, have the wrong idea about this shit, man. They think, yeah, they're out there getting fucked up, man. They're happy. No, we're not. No, we're not happy. We're not enjoying getting high. I quit enjoying getting high 30 years ago. But the problem was... I couldn't live without it. I mean, I would feel like my heart was going to burst. I couldn't breathe. I was scared to go anywhere. And it was horrible. Was it, uh, was it everything or anything? <sighs> like, what, what, what was drawn? What was pulling you? What drug or was, what alcohol? Yeah, what was it? Booze? Was uh, it for pills? me, it was more. 
more I was everything. More of just everything. More. I, I'm lucky I didn't get to in, into heroin. You know, I probably wouldn't have beat that one. But, uh, yeah, I would because that's this is what I'm meant to be doing right now. But to, to go through 25, 30 years of doing cocaine, you know. That's amazing. You know, I, I thank Vince McMahon for affording me my addiction because without it, I'd be in prison somewhere because I would have killed somebody for my drug. No, I, without a doubt, I would have, you know, <laughs> knifed him, whatever, man. That you got, he, that guy's got an eight ball, watch this. <laughs> Done. Life meant nothing to me, man. And he gets to a point where he, you put yourself in such a dark hole, there is no light, none at all. And it takes somebody that's special. You couldn't have sent me to rehab right then. Wouldn't have worked. I'd have, I'd have been out in, a, in minutes. Even when Dallas offered me to, to, to pay the whole trip and uh, you'll move in with him, we'll feed you the best damn food on the planet. We're going to get you healthy. We're going to get the bullshit out of your system. I'm like, yeah, 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 I'm going to last about a week. Because <laughs> I knew me and I'm like, dude, if I make it a week, I'm going to be doing good. Because at the time, I couldn't do 24 hours not doing cocaine. Wow. If you wanted me to get up out of bed, bring me some cocaine. <laughs> wow. That's where I was at. Because life was too ugly to want to go out there. When did it start? Did it start when your pro wrestling career started or was yeah, it going yeah. on before then? Uh, no. Uh, the cocaine and alcohol, alcohol was always there. I mean, I started drinking when I was 11 or 12. Whoa. My uh, grandfather was an alcoholic. Um, drug addict slash drug addict because it started with an oil field accident he got his legs crushed and uh he refused to have his legs cut off so he stayed in the hospital for 18 months well back in the 1920s the way that they fixed you was let it heal then re-break it oh. <laughs> you know that's what they did they didn't put bars and metal in there to straighten it out they'd let it heal then they'd re-break it a different way oh Jesus. and they kept him kept him on morphine for a year and a half. Well, at the end of a year and a half, they patted him on the back and said, see ya. He had a little itch going out there, didn't he? Yeah. Could he so walk after that? He could walk. So it worked, but it took a to year a and point, a half. To, to a point, but to a year hooked up on morphine, yeah. which back then, it wasn't like today. You can get on any corner. Right. He went to alcohol. I remember in the 60s, which is 40 years later, they not trusting him to come to the doctor's office well, they didn't trust him to take the pill. The pill the pill being, uh, oh, my God, what's it called? Keep you from drinking um, an abuse. You know, if you take an an abuse pill, you're not going to drink, brother. Except he did. I, I mean, I've drank on an abuse when it's been like two days since I'd had the pill and I have a drink. Brother, you have no idea how scary that shit is because immediately you start throwing up and you start pissing and shitting your pants it happens that quick and then you have to start with the sweats and all this and you'll wind up on the floor doing the heebie-jeebies man that's how strong an abuse is well they didn't even trust him to take the pill they said no no you, you take a taxi to the doctor's office and we'll give you a shot because we know you're not going to take that pill so he'd do that every morning wow. then he'd go outside and get in the same taxi and because we lived in a dry county, he would take that same taxi over to the next county and get a fifth of whiskey, drink it before he got home. Now the rest of his day spent shitting and puking. Wow. <sighs> but yet tomorrow he's going to do the same thing. Oh, my God. That's the hell. You know, I was doing the, doing, you know, doing the coke and stuff, man. I'm hating myself the whole time I do it. I'm not getting high anymore. And I can't put it down. I can't turn away from it because there's hope in that. What's the hope for? No more pain. So just that it numbs No you. more shame. That's what it numbs me from is the shame. You know, shame is something you put on yourself. You know, you can't shame me, man. I have to do it myself. But man, it was there, man. And because I'd went through some ugly shit as a kid, being sexually molested, my sister being molested too, and then my sister kidnapped and murdered, and we got all these things thrown in there, and I was hating myself because I didn't protect my sister better. 
Mm, you know, just, you know, you, you, life happens. What do you do with it? That's one of the things that Dallas preaches, you know, is about you got all this stuff out there, man. It's going to come at you. It's what you do with it that counts. You know, you don't deflect it. No, you bring it to you. You chew it up, you spit it out, you sort of sift through the bullshit, and you go on. That's something I couldn't do. Because then you got personal with me. And I would lock down. I'd shut up. Because that's how I handle things. I just didn't talk about it. When you've been sexually molested, <laughs> there is no good moment, man. And that screwed my head up, and it still messes with my head. I desperately, desperately want to have a relationship with a woman. You know, a true relationship, finally. <laughs> it's 63. Because I did have relationships before, but I was constantly sabotaging them because I didn't trust women. Because the last one, she raped me and beat me and threatened me and told her that my dad killed me because, you know, my dad was seven foot and weighed 425 pounds, so he could get the job done. But I just wanted my dad to be proud of me, so all these things are factoring in. I'm keeping mm -hmm. quiet while the wife beats me and has me do her and then beats me afterwards. Dude, sex ain't sex if you're doing it like that. That's called rape. And that shit screws your head up for life. Now, what do you do with it? Well, as a kid, I hid that shit, man. I stuffed it away. I didn't talk about that. Are you kidding me? When did you I remember start the talking first time it? talking about it to a high school buddy of mine. He says, you're so fucking lucky, man. You're, your stepmother's so fucking hot. She was hot. She's 22 years old. Because my father's a child molester, for Christ's sake. Of course she was hot. But it wasn't hot to me because that's my mom. No. And then the beatings afterwards, that fucking confuses you. Jeez. You got all this shit going, man. So you start looking for a way out. And for me, as a kid, my grandfather would get drunk and forget where he hid his liquor. Because he had to hide it from her grandmother because she knew what he was. She had dealt with it for 50 years. So every time she found a bottle on the farm, she had to break it and that's it. So he'd hide it in the chicken house, different places. Well, me and my buddies from across the street would go out and find it. We'd drink it. 12 years old, 11 years old. Then we got smart and started selling it to the other neighborhood kids, you know, make a buck. That was my beginning with drinking, man. And, uh, you know, as time goes on, man, you start smoking weed uh, and the pills. What else is next? Because I'm still not forgetting. I'm still remembering this shit. And you go out and you try to have a good time with people and then you realize something's different than you. Because drugs that put you to sleep wake me up. <laughs> you know? Downers wake me up. Like how so? I get wired. Really? You give me five Percocet, brother, I'll drink a case of beer and dance all night for you. Really? <laughs> go out and have three or four wrestling matches. Let's go to the... If I take... That's way, when I mess my neck up in 89... When I'll give me the guitar. When I wanted to go to the gym, my regimen was to wake up, go downstairs, start the coffee maker, take two men, 10 milligram Percocet, throw them in my mouth, chew them up, and wash them down with coffee, then hit the gym. Jesus. I loved it. Because I was on fire, man. Plus, the Percocet made me a little gnarly. Made me want to punch shit, you know? Really? So you get a good workout in there, couldn't you? From Percocets. Yeah. That's, that's how screwed up my wiring is. Wow. That is so... You talk to any drug and they'll tell you their wiring's fucked. Yeah. Things that make you go to sleep wake me up. Things that wake you up put me to sleep. So the, the pain of pro wrestling, which is probably one of the most brutal professions that yeah. a person can embark in. Right. And think about all the days that you were on the road, all the many, many matches, yeah. all that physical pain probably justified the drugs even more i didn't even care you didn't care the, um about the pain I, I, I don't I, I i felt no pain when i wrestled none afterwards no i was wrestling in a guy in uh, louisiana ernie the cat lad you remember him played for the afl san diego chargers he's in the hall of fame football and wrestling 
He was 6'9", 350. Badass son of a bitch, man. You know, but back then they had chop blocks and he had like 15 knee surgeries and that was in his Oof. career. But he, we were wrestling and my bone came out of my arm. Oof. Compound fracture. And he goes, kid, your arm. I'm like, yeah, I see it. It's gone. And he's like, what? Get away from me. And I, I'm trying to get to him and he starts puking on me. <laughs> I'm like, motherfucker, you're puking on me. Your arm, man, your arm, that's fucking bone, dude. I'm like, it don't hurt, come on, let's finish the match. <laughs> you your arm, man. Fuck you, I'm getting out of the ring. <laughs> man, he could puke up a bunch of shit, man. Oh, man, God six damn. foot nine. That's, yeah. You finish off your opponent by having him uh, hurl. Spew on you, yeah. yeah. Wow. It was nasty smelling shit, too, man. But I was fine, I got so back in the locker room. So you didn't even feel it? No, I was sitting there, and I was, I was saying, this is a strange feeling, I'd, I'd blow on the bone. Ooh, it, it feels cold when I blow on that bone. <laughs> wow. Whoa. 15 minutes later, I'm in the shower. <laughs> Holy fuck. Holy fuck! Boom. Then you felt it. The adrenaline's gone. Right. You've been in the ring, and you know what that's like. The adrenaline's going, nothing yeah. hurts. It feels good, in fact. You yeah, know but I, I would have thought that you would look at the bone and go, ooh, I got to handle this. No. Now, did you wrestle fucked up? No. no you wrestled straight? No, no, I was straight pretty much. You know, I might have been going through... Uh, withdrawals at the time but uh no i didn't drink or any of that shit before before match and i didn't like it but i did it that way because it's my duty and uh my thing is another wrestler to take care of my opponent I yeah. noticed that after, if, if I have like a fun set or something like that, doing stand-up comedy, that I like to have, like if it went, if I tried something new mm. and, it w and it went extra good, I like to have an extra drink or two that night. Would sure. it be like that for you in wrestling? Would you get more messed up if it was like Madison Square Garden? No, not or, really. uh, no I just did like, it until I went to sleep. You know? Right. Because sleep was such a premium back then. You know, we, back in our, back in my day, we were wrestling seven days a week. Seven days a week. Well, except for Saturday and Sunday, then we wrestled twice on Saturday, twice on Sunday. Jesus! Like you might do the L.A. Coliseum at two o'clock, and then get in the rental car and drive to San Diego, so you can do a seven o'clock. Wow! The next day you might be in Omaha at two o'clock, then you'd be in Des Moines at seven o'clock. Now you're driving all this in between. Yeah. You know, you fly, you drive. Well. With me, it made it even worse because I got to drag that fucking snake everywhere. <laughs> you know, eighty pound box of shit. Right. Be like trying to carry this around, you know, with a bad back over there. Hey, folks out there, pray for him, man. He's over there hooing, mooing back here. He's making fun of young Jamie. Young Jamie. God. As a minor in fact. It's very difficult to talk about injuries when you're around Jake yeah, the Snake. Shit, <laughs> I want to bring it up. Tony, Tony threw me under the bus. Yeah. He told me before when I first got here, he's like, I pulled my back the other day, uh, but I don't want to mention it in front of Jake the Snake because it's embarrassing. It should be embarrassing. It should you know, be. You know what he did? He, he, tore his man, he tore his mangina. Oh, you know, he sneezed and tore his mangina.